Then I think I assume that's in it. Not sure. Um, you can use the microphone over there as well. You can. Uh, Hello, good morning. Before we start the event, I would like to invite the guests to be seated. Your cooperation is highly appreciated. Thank you. There's my over there, so it's okay. Yes, do you? Yeah. So is there? Oops. Oops. Not this one. It's very far away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what? Do they have you? We found a. Oh, you found one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. There's other ones. They do not touch the cable. Okay. Yeah. Radio. <laughs> Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, okay, so we are lucky this morning with us, uh, Professor Melani from uh, Katin University. Uh, for your information, Professor, some of us are amateur radio persons, I think, at the back. So your project is on uh, radio astronomy, isn't it? Okay, so this is uh, the application of uh, radio frequency so that to study the universe smashing oh we are smashing now 
the largest object in the universe. Okay, right. So I think none of us have seen this. So let's just wait until the end of the lecture. Supaya kita tahu apa sebenarnya yang berlanggar ni sebenarnya. So menggunakan frekuensi radio lah kita dapat melihat objek-objek itu. Okay. So I'll pass to the MC today. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh and good morning to Mr Zamri uh, Shah bin Masto Chief Senior Assistant Director of Planetarium Negara Professor Dr Melanie Johnston Holid Director of the Curtin Institute for Data Science CIDS and of the Australian City or our staff Professor Dr Zamri Zainal Abidin Head of the Honorable Welcome. Entitled Smashing the Largest Objects in the Universe Together and What We Know About Galaxy Clusters. On behalf of University Malaya and I'd like to extend a very warm welcome. To begin to this our guest speaker is an Australian astrophysicist radio astronomer and Dr. Johnston Hollid attended the University of Adelaide where she graduated with two degrees in theoretical and experimental mathematics. She also completed a BS under the supervision of Roger Clay and a doctorate in radio astronomy jointly with the University of Adelaide and the Cicero Australia Telescope National Facility, ATNF, under the supervision of Ron Ackers and Richard Hunstad. Her magnetism and observations of galaxy clusters in her more than 20 she has also worked on the design, construction and international governance of several radio telescopes around the world including the Low Frequency Array, or LOFA, the Murchison White Field Array, or MWA, and the upcoming Square Kilometer Array, or SKA. She was the director of the MWA until December 2020, and now two institutes, which are Curtin Institute for Data Science, or CIDS, and Australian ASDAF. Professor Johnston Hollid has also focused in a broad range of her expertise and received numerous fellowships and awards. So without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Johnston Hollid to deliver her talk. Prof. Johnston Hollid, the floor is yours. Yes. All right. So. Thank you very much. I am delighted to be back here at uh, the Planetarium Nagara here in Kuala Lumpur to speak to you all. Um, so today I'm going to talk about galaxy clusters, which as Scheifel said in his extensive introduction, uh, is the primary field of research that I did. And this is actually going to be a retrospective look um, over the last 20 years about what we know about galaxy clusters. So I'm, I'm going to start with a bit of a journey of what does the universe look like? So what are galaxy clusters? What are they comprised of? How big are they? Um, how do they form? So this is a brief overview of large scale structure formation in the universe. And what happens to them when you smash them together? What happens when they collide? So these are going to be some examples of the, the largest crashes in the universe. So to begin, let's take a God's eye view of the universe. So if you were God and you could step outside of the universe, this is what you would see. So this is... Um, a simulation it was actually done in 2005, so quite a long time ago now, but is still actually one of the most accurate simulations that we have of what the large scale structure of the universe looks like. So this kind of spidery web-like stuff, which we call the cosmic web, is the home to 97% of all the galaxies that we have, um, and all of the gas and dust and so forth sits inside these filamentary regions. At the nodules of these filaments, is where we get galaxy clusters, which is what I'm going to talk about uh, for the rest of this talk. So the cosmic web, uh, actually, that was a simulation that I showed you, but this is real data. 
So this is observations of the cosmic web taken um, with an optical telescope. So this was a survey of the nearest, I think 500,000, maybe, uh, maybe a million, maybe more, maybe a billion galaxies, a lot of galaxies. Um, and so these are optical galaxies. So these are actually, from our point of view, every little dot here is an optical galaxy and the positions tell us how far away they are. So this is really a structure that we see. We see it in the galaxy distribution of the universe. Uh, this is my colleague Franco Vass's simulation, which includes not only the galaxies, but also the dust and the gas and the magnetic field that sits around them in cosmic filaments. So I want to zoom in now to where we have clusters be created. So if we move in, uh, in ever increasing boxes to one of these higher density regions in the cosmic web, because on, on the larger scale, the universe looks uniform everywhere. It looks what we call isotropic. But as you move in to these regions of higher density, you discover that it's not isotropic on smaller scales and that there are in fact differences. And so this is um, an intersection of filaments of the cosmic web where hundreds of galaxies reside. This is a so-called galaxy cluster. And, ah, very good. And so this is simulation. Some of the clusters. Yes. <laughs> this is a simulation, but this is real data. This is a, a galaxy cluster with the name Abel 3888. Um, now, the reason it's called Abel is because back in the 1950s, a guy called George Abel uh, spent his whole life looking at maps of the sky and the optical and picking out over dense regions. And he made a catalog of 4,000 of these things. They've got names from one up to just over 4,000. So this one is in the Southern Hemisphere because he did the Southern Hemisphere last, and it's called Abel 3888. And what you're looking at here is real data from seven different telescopes. This is work done by one of my previous students, Sarah Shakuri. And to tell you what the parts are, so this is there's no optical data in this one. This one's just radio and X-ray data, but um, everything you see here, this is an individual galaxy, all these little points here, you know, with 10 to the 11 stars in it. Um, the blue stuff is actually radio emission that we see across the galaxy cluster, and the orange stuff is X-ray emission. So that's showing you that there's gas and dust and magnetic fields here. And these things here are active galactic nuclei. So they're galaxies which have supermassive black holes in them, which are emitting jets of electrons, which accelerate particles, uh, or as accelerated particles give rise to radio emission. So these are the things we're talking about. Now, how do they form? I have to step back a bit and talk about the history of the universe to explain this. So many of you may have seen these type of cartoons before. This is a conceptualization of all that we know of cosmology. This is a conceptualization of the history of our universe, where we start with the Big Bang on this end, and we go through a period of really rapid inflation. And then uh, because of the rapid inflation, we go through a period of cooling and reionization, and eventually you get uh, structures start to form. Now, in this period here, for reasons that we don't actually understand but are extremely important, there were very small scale fluctuations in the density of the early universe. So, really small, like one particle in a billion. And the fact that you and I and all of us are sitting here today is because of that. Had the universe expanded and had uniform density, none of us would have been here because it's that really small scale fluctuations in the early universe that actually allowed us to have all of this structure then form over the 13.7 billion year history of the universe. And we can actually observe this uh, imprint of this small scale fluctuation in the cosmic microwave background radiation, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later on, but that's this layer here. So we have small scale fluctuations and then under the influence of gravity, all of this structure then evolves, including the formation of, of galaxy clusters, which are comprised of individual galaxies, which of course have solar systems in them, like the one that we currently reside in. And I'm gonna talk about the actual physical scales of these um, a bit later on. Rob, yeah. Where are the smashes? Ah, the smashes actually happen in this part here. Yeah, yeah, back, back, quite, quite a long way back. Yes, absolutely. So um, we actually see evidence of things smashing all the way back to here. So this is about, say, 300 million years after the Big Bang. 
Yes, the universe is young on this side, and this is where we are today on this side. So this is 13.7 billion years of history in one cartoon. But the important point, and it's a good question that you raise, uh, is when do these first galaxies actually form? And, and the answer is quite close to, to here. So a really long way back, and we know this from JWST observations. So I'm going to show some pictures uh, taken with the James Webb Telescope earlier this year of the oldest galaxies that we've imaged in the universe. We are witnessing, today. We are witnessing it today. So very old photons traveling a really long way to get to us. So astronomy is cool because it's like archaeology, because light travels at a finite speed, which means that things that happen here, the photons from here, are still traveling to us. And so we can actually peel back the layers of the history of the universe um, in astronomy, just like we do with geology when you dig down. It's very, very similar, or archaeology. All right, now, in the introduction, it was explained that I'm going to talk about radio telescopes. Um, I wanted to give a very brief uh, introduction to the electromagnetic spectrum, just for those people who are unfamiliar with it. So the electromagnetic spectrum spans from high energy gamma rays all the way through the visible. So this is the optical part of the spectrum that we see with our eyes. So most um, optical telescopes are observing here. Through the infrared, where you've got telescopes like a near infrared like James Webb and Hubble, and down the microwave into the radio. So I'm a radio astronomer, so I work in this part. So I'm working with very long wavelengths that are not particularly energetic, um, but they're useful for understanding the physics of what's going in sources. Now, as with most sources in the universe, we actually observe them across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, which means we need a range of different types of radio, or, sorry, of telescopes to do that. So we've got everything from gamma ray telescopes like HESS, which is in Africa, so this is the Cherenkov telescope, all the way up to this array of beautiful space telescopes that get us above the interference of the atmosphere, through to ground-based optical telescopes like SALT in South Africa, Gemini, Keck, and then you've got satellites like Hubble, and then over here we've got what I use, which is radio telescopes. There have been radio telescopes in space, but it's very rare. We don't do it very often. We mostly are observing from the ground. All right, so just remember those are the sort of telescopes and frequencies we're using, because galaxy clusters, you need to observe them at all different wavelengths to see what's going on. So these things are the largest gravitationally bound structures in the universe. They're home to the gas, the dust, and billions of stars. Um, and most of the galaxies in the universe actually reside in clusters themselves, or as I said, filaments of the cosmic web, so 97%. I lost my mic, um, sit in the cosmic web. And the study of galaxy clusters is really important because it gives us answers to a really wide range of physics questions that we have in modern astrophysics, such as where is matter concentrated in the universe, and hence what will the fate of the universe is, it will be. So we need to understand where the matter is to project what's going to happen. Are we going to have a big crunch? Are we going to have, you know, heat death? What's going to go on? Um, and what I study also is how did primordial magnetic fields arise in the universe and where are they strongest? So this is again an image of a, of a galaxy cluster done by one of my former students, Stefan, Stefan Duchesne. And what you're seeing here is you're seeing an optical image in the background. So every little dot here is an optical galaxy. And then this is the galaxy cluster. And you can see two things here. So you can see radio emission in this magenta color and you can see X-ray. So the X-ray emission is produced by uh, a process called thermal bremsstrahlung, which is where you slow down charged particles passing by a, another charged particle that gives rise to um, X-ray emission. And the radio emission is produced by synchrotron emission. So this is electrons spiraling in a magnetic field. So, but the point here is the scale. So this is a galaxy. You can see this is enormous. These are huge structures, and they are bound together by gravity. So there's gas, and dust, and gravity, hundreds of galaxies. All right, so to, to come to the structure and the scale. So here's a picture of the Earth. Um, I, I centered it on this hemisphere, and uh, you know Australia, you can see Malaysia, it's very nice. Uh, so the diameter of the Earth is about 13,000 kilometers, so 1.3 times 10 to the 4. We, of course, sit inside our solar system. Our solar system is uh, about six times 10 to the nine kilometers in diameter, right? It sits inside the Milky Way, which is a barred spiral galaxy, 
not dissimilar to this one. That, of course, is not the Milky Way <laughs> because we can't take a photo of the Milky Way. We're sitting inside it. But it's a representative spiral galaxy. Uh, the Milky Way is 80 kiloparsecs across, for those of you who use astronomical units, which is about 2.5 times 10 to the 15 uh, kilometres in diameter. And it sits on the edge of the Virgo cluster, which is 3 megaparsecs, or 7.5 times 10 to the 18 kilometres across. So what that means is a galaxy cluster is 600 million million times larger than the Earth. So these are very large structures. Now, let's talk about what's in them. So as I said, they comprise primarily of galaxies. Uh, they come in groups of tens of galaxies up to thousands of galaxies. Uh, the type of galaxies that they have in them, uh, mostly ellipticals in the center, and the very center of a galaxy cluster will have a really large elliptical galaxy called a central dominant galaxy. This is the Coma Cluster. This is one of the clusters very nearby to, to us. This is an optical image. And these things here, these huge big galaxies compared to all the other ones, these are the central dominant galaxies. So they sit at the center of the gravitational well. These show you where the, the gravity is strongest. And all those other galaxies are orbiting around those big ones. Um, all of the galaxies inside a cluster have similar ages, redshifts, and velocities. And we find clusters at a range of uh, redshifts, so points in the history of the universe, and some of them are quite old, so this has strong implications on cosmology. So this goes back to your question of where do the smashes happen? Well, you've got to form the clusters first, and then you smash them, and it goes right back to the very early universe, so up to only 300 million years after the Big Bang. All right. So, as I said, we've also got spiral galaxies. Spiral galaxies in clusters sit on the edges, and there's also other types of galaxies like dwarfs, irregulars, ultra-compact. And we can observe the galaxy constituents in optical, radio, X-ray, UV across the electromagnetic spectrum. Then there's the gas and dust. We can't see that in the optical. It doesn't emit. So we have to use X-ray and radio. So all the images I've shown you so far, we've talked about the X-ray and radio emission. That's tracing that gas and dust and plasma. And then there's dark matter. There's also dark matter halos associated with clusters. And what they show us, so observations of uh, indicators of dark matter, we don't observe it directly, shows us that about 90% of the mass that sits in a cluster like this is not observable in the electromagnetic spectrum directly. So I can show you that that's the outline of a cluster in X-ray, but that's only showing you that plus the galaxies is only 10% of the mass. The rest of it's dark matter. So these are big dark matter halos, which is what gives them the big gravitational fields. So it's important to observe these things in a range of different things. Um, all right, we classify them in two types. So rich versus poor. So it's an age-old question of class. So a rich galaxy cluster is one like Coma, which has over a 1,000 galaxy members. So this is a very beautiful three-color optical image of Coma. Um, a a galaxy cluster is one which might only have 10. And in fact, this is an example here where this is an optical image in the background and these are X-ray contours. And if I took those X-ray contours away, you wouldn't be able to tell that there was a galaxy cluster there. The only reason that you can tell is because we can see it's got enough gravitational um, attraction to hold that X-ray plasma there. So it's really important when you're looking for galaxy clusters that you use uh, multiple different types of uh, observations to detect them. So I told you this guy, George uh, Abel, who back in the 1950s started counting the optical galaxy over densities. He missed a huge number of clusters. He missed ones like this because he was looking only in one wavelength. So you have to use X-ray and SZ and other types. All right, let's talk about how they form. All right, so as I said right at the start, so galaxy clusters, and in fact, all the structures seen in the universe today can be traced back to the Big Bang. So we had the Big Bang, uh, a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, known as the Planck time, so 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the Big Bang happened, there was, as I said, for reasons we don't know, a very, very small uh, change in the density of the early universe. And under inflation, that gives rise to the cosmic white wave background map, which I'm going to show you in a minute. And then from that, under gravity, all of the things that we see today, 13.7 billion years later, including all of us here. So thank God for that. That was really important. 
So this is the original map of the cosmic microwave background and isotropy. So the CMB was first detected. Actually, this is probably the result that's won the most Nobel Prizes. So I think there's now six Nobel Prizes or six people have been awarded three Nobel Prizes for this um, particular discovery. So it was discovered by radio astronomers um, as a hiss in one of their antennas. So there was radio astronomers from Bell Labs and they were trying to, they weren't doing radio astronomy, they were engineers actually. They were pointing their um, antenna at the sky and they kept getting this hiss and they didn't know what it was. And colleagues down the road in Princeton actually had a theory that they should see this microwave background or hear this microwave background and isotropy with a radio telescope and they put those two things together and they said yes it's there and then many years later so this was I think it's back in the 50s forget but many years later in the 80s um, George Smoot and colleagues proposed uh, a satellite telescope to go out into space and try and observe the fluctuations in that cosmic microwave background to show that there was this uh, anisotropy, so it's not completely uniform. And so they built a telescope called COBE and they went out to observe it and this was what they got. So this uh, result, this is the whole sky and these are essentially hot and cold regions in the whole sky as measured against the cosmic microwave background radiation. And this is actually telling you that the structure in the early universe just after the Big Bang wasn't uniform. Now, that was enough to get them the Nobel Prize. They got the Nobel Prize for that, but they didn't stop there. They built two more sets of satellites, or well, astronomers built two more sets of satellites to do it. So this is the W, sorry, this is the, yes, WMAP nine year observation. So it's the same thing, just better resolution. So you can start to see more detail. And then we did it again with Planck. So this is, again, the cosmic microwave background radiation. And I like this picture here because it shows you the same piece of sky, which is a tiny little piece in here, with the resolution of Kobe that got the Nobel Prize, then WMAP, and then Planck. And so you can see we're just zooming in on those anisotropies. And that's what gives rise to all the structure that we see. And we can run simulations to show that. And I'm going to do that here. So this is a section of the universe. Uh, if your projector was better, you would be able to see that this has the same level of background fluctuations as in the cosmic microwave background maps that I've just showed. But don't worry, because as I run it, it will become obvious. So what we're going to do here, this is a simulation of fluctuations in the early universe just after the Big Bang to explain how we get to large scale structure, how we get to galaxy clusters. So we're just going to run it forward in time, about 13 billion years, and you'll see what happens just under gravity. So, come on, come on. I don't know how to get it to play. There we go. So, you start to see things coming together, falling in. So, just under gravitational attraction, you build these filaments of the cosmic web, and then clumps fall in, and that's how we form galaxy clusters. Yes. 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 Yes, essentially. But these are just particles. This is just mass, really. It's not really mapping energy. So what you're seeing is uh, the fluctuations in mass due to gravity. So it's just pulling stuff in. And when you get to the center, you get something like this on a much higher resolution uh, observation. So here, uh, Klaus Doleg has simulated again little dots of individual galaxies, so 10 to the 11 stars in each of those, and then you've got the two components, the X-ray and the radio, uh, emitting plasma. So you can just see it rotate. So that's what you get in the center of this, but at a higher resolution. So you can see that's essentially what a galaxy cluster looks like. And this one might fall into the gravitational well of that one. So these smashes, they've been happening since the early universe. So if I take the simulation right back to the start, you see smashes all the way along. And that's extremely important. And we, what we actually see, in addition to the smashes, the galaxy clusters themselves, all along these cosmic filaments, there's little accretion shocks. There's tiny little things that happen as we go along. All right, I'll come back to this. So um, observations of very distant galaxies that we see in the early 
epochs of the universe actually show us that they're not actually comprised of well-formed galaxies. So galaxies in the modern universe are either beautiful elliptical galaxies or they're lovely spirals or sometimes irregular, but mostly those two. In the very early universe, they're actually fragments. They're irregular. They're fuzzy looking things. This is a really deep image. Um, this was done with Hubble. So this is actually about 15 years old. This was um, some of the earliest galaxies we could see in the universe with Hubble at the time. And as we go forward in time, we see a bit better. So these are red because they're cosmologically red shifted. But you can see the kind of Manky, <laughs> they're not well formed. And, and the reason for this is because of all these little collisions. So in addition to the big collisions of clusters, you get micro collisions of the galaxies themselves. And so if we go now to an observation done this year with the James Webb telescope, these are the oldest galaxies in the universe that we've yet observed. So the highest has a redshift of 13.3, which is only 320 million years after the Big Bang. So really, um, 10 billion years old. And again, you can see these things are messy. They are complicated. They're essentially building structure. We're building our galaxies as we go. Now, we do see this type of thing in the modern universe too. This is an example of uh, two interacting galaxies. This is the famous antenna galaxies. This is what they look like in a wide optical image. So you can see these are two spiral galaxies. And there's these huge trails of stars that have been thrown out when these two things smash together. If we look in the center, what we can actually see is very clearly two separate nuclei. Um, so these are old stars in the center. This is lovely, new, hot, young, blue stars, star formation around the edges. And this is what happens repeatedly in galaxy clusters. So that central dominant galaxy is actually ca is a cannibal. So as all the little galaxies fall into the center of the gravitational well, they cannibalize and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's how we get these giant elliptical galaxies sitting in the center of clusters. Now, this is another movie. This is just gonna show an example of what happens. So lovely spiral galaxy here is gonna smash into another spiral galaxy there. This is all just under the influence of gravity. So you see these tails of stars being thrown out, messy looking stuff like we see in the early universe. And then eventually, over time, and this simulation runs for 4 billion years. Uh, <laughs> yes, you get the left. And we think this happens repeatedly at the center of galaxy clusters. They smash together. All right. So um, if we look at the optical, we find that uh, the galaxies that are in clusters are most usually studied in the optical. As I said, Abel was the first to catalog them, but we know three things. One, that 75% of galaxies in more distant clusters are spiral galaxies, and that this number reduces as we move forward in time. So this makes sense, because if you smash two spirals together, the simulations show that you get an elliptical. So as time goes on, we get fewer and fewer spiral galaxies in the center of clusters. So they become less blue. This is the thing called the butcher amler effect. In early clusters at high redshifts, we've got these really weird and distorted um, fragmentary galaxies, which again support the central dominant galaxy formation through cannibalism argument. And mass studies using gravitational lensing tell us that there's a huge amount of mass to be there to actually attract them in to start with. So at other wavelengths, um, we see other things. We see the dust and gas uh, components, the plasma components. So like all objects in the universe, it's no good just looking at one part of the electromagnetic spectrum to understand clusters. To do the physics properly, we actually have to do it in multiple things, so X-ray and radio are the other things, which show us the truly coherent nature of clusters, because what that shows us is the outline of where they've got enough gravity to hold a plasma. So the optical galaxies should trace that, but they don't always, but roughly. But this is really, this is an X-ray observation, um, really important to see the outline of the cluster uh, I just also want to highlight gravitational lensing. So this is a Hubble Space Telescope image that was done of a galaxy cluster by uh, Warwick Couch from Australia. It's called A2218, so again, Abel2218. And what you're seeing here, this is the CD galaxy, giant elliptical. And all these arcs here, this is actually 
uh, galaxies in the background whose images have been distorted by the mass that sits in the cluster. There's so much dark matter in that cluster that it acts as a lens and it bends light. So gravity bends light. So that's what we're seeing here. So that's gravitational lensing. And by looking at that, we can work out how much dark matter sits there. That's a whole other topic. So again, just to sort of give the comparison, these are two very nearby galaxy clusters in the optical at the bottom and in the X-ray at the top. And so you can see this is Virgo, big CD galaxy, lots of little galaxies orbiting it, but you can't tell how big it is. But in the X-ray, you can see there's X-ray plasma here. You can also see this group here has enough mass to hold X-ray plasma. This group probably merging with that. This is Coma, we showed earlier in the talk. Two CD galaxies in Coma, probably because of a collision, huge amount of X-ray surrounding the whole thing. All right. I have lost a picture. Right. Um, so we started to probably in the late 80s and 90s use X-ray telescopes to look for what's known as substructure in clusters to try and understand if they were nice and relaxed and spherical or whether they were undergoing some sort of dynamical process. And so this is Coma that we've just seen. This is a, a satellite called ROSAT, which was operated as a joint German um, Russian satellite uh, operated in the 80s and 90s. And then this is XMM Newton. So same object, just this is a much better telescope. You can see much more resolution. But you can still see there's this piece here, which is probably going to smash onto there. So X-ray observations of the hot thermal gas give rise to detailed information on the cluster temperature, the entropy, the dynamical state, and they also allude to this missing mass problem. So until the early 2000s, X-ray observations were actually the only thing hinting that clusters might collide and merge. So we see features in the X-ray gas, like these sharp features here, that we tried to sort of understand from a, a physics perspective. So that was the first thing. But then came radio. So now I'm going to talk about the actual work that I used to do. So this is me uh, at the start of my PhD in 1998 at the uh, Compact Array. This is one of the six antennas of the Compact Array Radio Telescope in Australia. It's the instrument that I did my PhD on. It's a very old photo that I had to dig out. Um, so my the PhD project was to look at galaxy clusters with a radio telescope. So radio telescopes can detect very, very faint emission given off not only by the individual galaxies, which host supermassive black holes, but from this cloud, these clouds of accelerated electrons, which are moving in magnetic fields in the clusters. And early observations of galaxy clusters in the radio didn't show much. They only showed the individual galaxies. So we didn't find these clouds of electrons that are emitting radio. And it was only in the late 90s when I started uh, that we started actually able to find this really large scale emission with radio telescopes. So this, this is an image from my PhD thesis. This was done 23 years ago. And what you're looking at here is the, Gabor, the, this is the galaxy cluster Abel 3667, very famous galaxy cluster. The colored stuff, and actually, when I finished my PhD, CSIRO made me a huge big picture of this and framed it, and it hangs on my, my wall at home. Um, anyway, what you're looking at here is data that took me three years to collect. Yeah. There are hundreds of hours of observations on that telescope, the compact array, uh, in this map here. We actually had to point the telescope in 40 different positions and then mosaic the images together. And I had to do it at five frequencies. Uh, and so the data comes from 2000. And uh, took from 1996 to 2000, and then it took me quite a long time to process it. And this is X-ray gas here in the center. And these, this is radio emission here. So an individual galaxy looks like this in the radio, looks like a dot. And these two huge things here are what's called radio relics. Now, I won't go into why they're called radio relics. It's a stupid name. It's a misnomer. It's from a previous misunderstanding of what they're from. But this was the first one where we saw a pair of them. So this object up here, this had been known since the 60s, but this one down here I found in my thesis. And it was the first time we'd seen these two huge things here seen on either side of the cluster. And so it's important to understand that that's six and a half million light years across. So these are huge. 
These are huge areas of radio emission. And you can't have that be generated by a single black hole. It has to be generated by something that's happening across a huge chunk of the universe simultaneously. And so what we think these are from are from cluster mergers. So at about the time I was doing this imaging, there was a guy called Kurt Rodiger who was a theoretical astrophysicist. And he asked the question of what would happen if we smashed two clusters together in terms of the plasma physics. And he published a paper independently which showed these are the X-ray contours he thought you would get. And this is the radio emission that Kurt predicted that you would get from smashing two clusters together if you then had shock waves come out into the uh, into, into cluster medium. So you get a shock wave when you move faster than the speed of sound in the medium. It's like a sonic boom. So that's what this was predicting, that these were sonic booms, but on incredibly vast scales. Pretty good prediction, turned out to be right. So cluster mergers. When we smash two clusters together, it's the most energetic thing in the universe. And this figure here just shows you pairs of different galaxy clusters as they're approaching each other before they merge, and then this one after. So these are real observations. The X-ray is in purple, it's from the Chandra X-ray telescope. The pink is radio. And what you're getting here is, you see not much happening in the radio there, not much, not much, not much. Here, where we've started to interact, you can start to see some really weird radio stuff. And this one, which has already gone through a merger, you can see this incredibly sharp linear radio feature, which is huge. And that's, that's again, this shock wave. So how strong are these things? So it's 10 to the 66 ergs per second, which is enough power to um, put all of the electricity and power needs of Malaysia uh, on for 10 to the 40 years. Or if we do the whole world, uh, we can power, we can have all of the Earth's power uh, for 10 to the 37 years, which is this number here. So we could power, this happens in one single merger. Now, unfortunately, the Earth doesn't have that long, so that's sad. But anyway, just to give you an idea of how big a number this is, so these are incredibly energetic events. These are the most energetic things that we have in the universe. Um, and yes, when the clusters collide, the material in them, the gas and the dust moves faster than the speed of sound, and so this gives rise to a shock wave. So these have Mach numbers of the order of two to three, and that's what then accelerates these electrons that then produce radio emission, which shows up in the pink. And we can see this again in simulation. So I'm gonna smash two clusters together here. On, the, on this side, we're looking at density. So this is essentially the gas density. And on the other side, this is velocity, velocity and entropy. But let's, let's smash two together and see what happens. So this is what your gas does. It sloshes back and forth and over, um, this is 11 giga years. So over the history, almost all the whole history of the universe, it relaxes back to nothing. Now, I'm gonna try and do this and stop it at the right point. Oh, this one's shocks. So you can see a big shock go out. So there's a foreshock and an aft shock in the velocity. I'm gonna try and run these again at the, uh, stop, no, I'm not gonna be able to do it. I haven't got my mouse. Oh, anyway, we'll move on and we'll show you what it looks like when you actually stop it at the right point. So this is now combined the two here. And so what you can see is there's a really big shock front here in the direction of the merger. And then there's a very short, sharp aft shock. And this is the real data in the radio from the cluster A3667 rotated to the same um, thing. So you can see that's exactly what you get. So the theory works. So these are the largest sonic booms in the universe. And we can only see them with radio telescopes. So when I started to do this, this was the first example known where you could where you saw both the fore and aft shock in the radio. This is 20 years ago. And these were, the, these were really rare, they were hard to detect. Very, very faint, um, but over very large scales. Now, in the last few years, we've had uh, a renaissance in radio astronomy. So originally these sources were hard to detect, only a few known and only two examples of a double relic. So the one was called 3376. But we started to upgrade old telescopes or build new telescopes. So from 2010, we either upgraded telescopes like the compact array, which is what I used, so it was better. We built telescopes like LOFAR, which Shifel explained in the 
um, introduction I was involved in the Kurtz design for. It was open in 2011. The JVLA got upgraded in 2012. The MWA, which I was heavily involved in, was built in 2012. ASCAP 2015, Meerkat 2015, and the upgraded GMRT in 2017. So these instruments had better resolution and were more sensitive and could survey huge areas of the sky really fast. And what we found is collectively, we found hundreds of these things. So we went from two 20 years ago to hundreds now. And I'm going to show you some examples. So these are just examples uh, from various different of those telescopes that I mentioned. So the first one is ASCAP. This again is worked on by former student Stefan. So X-ray, radio, two beautiful shock waves sitting either side. side of the VLA by John and Larry Rudnick. Um, the X-ray sits here. This is only the radio about radio. So that's the single one. This this one I like. This, this paper came out about a week ago. This is with the UGMRT by Raja Odell. And so this is the X-ray contours. This is radio in the background. Huge big shock thing here. And then you can see a bridge of electrons emitting in the radio going all the way back to the center of the cluster. And this is a weird thing which we call the USS Jellyfish, um, done by my other former student, Torrance. And uh, this is the steepest spectral index source in the universe. For those of you that know about radio, this is uh, something you can only see at very low frequencies. So we don't see this above 200 megahertz. And that's the X-ray there. It sits on the edge of the cluster. It's not actually a relic. It's not from a shot. Its energetics are a bit different, but it's a cool picture, so I show it. So, we have a universe of shockwaves. It's cool. Um, so we found so many. Many of them. Is that merging clusters are not the only place we expect shocks. If we go back to the cosmic web and the simulations that I showed you, when all this stuff starts to collapse and come together, you get micro shocks everywhere. You get matter creating all of We simulated the location of shocks in the cosmic web itself. So not just on the edges of clusters, but across all the little parts of the the cosmic web. Now, this is what radio emission from the cosmic web would look like if you could detect the emission from all those shocks. And you can see these things look hollow, and that's because the shocks are happening on the edges of the filaments. So this is what you should be able to see. So we thought, okay, we've got better telescopes. Let's see if we can see it. So first we made a, a simulation. Uh, this is the best simulation of the radio sky ever done, again, done by Torrance. Um, this is what the shock should look like. This is mass density, so this is showing you where the dark matter halos are, if you like. And these are all the individual radio galaxies which sit over the top of it. So this is what it would look like if we could detect it. You can see that most of the shock emission is actually washed out by the radio foreground. That's because this stuff here that's showing us the accretion shocks is 10 to 100 times fainter than the emission that we see on the edges of clusters right now. So we're, we're trying to do this experiment to push down. So we did a lot of work. We spent three years observing, and we didn't find it. <laughs> but we group to try it. Uh, groups across the world in the Netherlands and in the US and Canada gave it a crack, and they didn't find it either. So we've concluded that our telescopes are not good enough for that piece. Just like the telescopes we had 20 years ago weren't good enough to detect all of the shocks that we see around, big shocks that we see around galaxy clusters. But that's okay, because we're going to get this telescope. So this is the square kilometer array low. Um, it will be eight times more sensitive than the best low frequency telescopes we've got now. It's going to be comprised of 131,000 dipole antennas in the desert in Australia. It's under construction as we speak. It will produce uh, 157 terabytes of raw data per second. 
So that's the equivalent of 32,000 DVDs per second and about five zettabytes of data a year, intermittent data. And we're going to try and do this again with this instrument when it's finished. So in summary, the universe is dynamic. Things smash into each other. Uh, they produce huge sonic booms. Uh, on the edges of galaxy clusters. These things happen on scales longer than human comprehension and on sizes larger than human comprehension. Um, and these shock waves can be detected with radio telescopes. And though they were rare 20 years ago, with current radio telescopes, we've now found hundreds of them and think half the clusters of the universe have got this type of merger induced radio emission on the edges. The next thing to do is detect the weaker, smaller accretion shocks of the cosmic web. And as I said, we can't do it with the telescopes we've got now, but we're getting at the SK, so we might be able to do it then. So my prediction is the next 20 years is going to be the same as the last, except we're going to start to see these small-scale accretion shocks in the actual cosmic web itself. So invite me back in 20 years, and I'll tell you what happens. Thank you. I'm using this. All right. Okay, um, now we will be having a Q&A session, so if anybody has please do so. And we've got a few questions. Yeah. Uh, we can view many new things detecting gravitational waves, but not this stuff. So the way that we detect gravitational waves is through the distortion of space-time itself, whereas this is looking at actual electromagnetic emissions. So gravitational waves is a different process. Yeah. No, because we sit inside it. If, if you're inside a forest, you're standing inside the forest, you you don't have a drone to be able to take a photo above you. So we can only infer the structure of our, our own galaxy by looking at this through it. We're looking... Correct. Yes. Okay, so, yes, look, man. Yeah, so, so superclusters are not gravitationally bound, which is why I don't consider them to be coherent structures. So if I go back, so if I go back here, um, we might find a, a galaxy cluster here, and at the same sort of distance of the universe, we might find this filament and other galaxy clusters here, and they might form a, a supercluster. But those things are not gravitationally bound because the distance between the two nodes is such that the one on R uh, squared drop off of gravity makes them not that coherent. So they do form in the same sort of planes, if you like, in redshift space, but they're not gravitationally bound themselves. So, yeah. Uh, as I said, rich versus poor. So how many galaxies do they have in them? Um, and then you can look at their mass. So we get a range of mass distributions for galaxy clusters that you can drive both from the X-ray and from things like gravitational lensing. Um, and then other than that, their dynamical state. So are they in a pre-merger state? Are they relaxed where they're nice and spherical? Or are they in a post-merger state where they've smashed together and they've got some features in the X-ray and radio um, and also the optical galaxy distribution that support that. So we look at the the way they evolve over time in terms of those properties around dynamical state. All right, so I think there is a question online. So, from, so what's your opinion on the recent numbers up to 26.7 giga year to fit the GWS, the observation? And then he puts the... Uh, put the, the link in the paper. I haven't read it, so I can't give you an opinion. <laughs> but I will read it. Thank you for that. All right. So can we open to the floor? So from, can we go back to the merger picture? Uh, yep. Uh, this, this one or the, the actual picture? This one, yeah. yeah. 
how long does it take? Oh, <laughs> giga years. So this is a true picture, These are real pictures, but, but they're not, not they're separate, they're separate clusters, they're individual objects. So what we're doing is we're seeing them in different snapshots because obviously we can only see an instant in time. Um, so the simulations that I showed you will show that some of these things can merge on the scale of sort of 10 giga years. What we tend to see is about four or so. So when we see the shock waves at the edges of clusters, we think that's roughly four giga years since the merge has happened. So we're looking sort of a third of the way back, the history of the universe. So these, to be clear, these are different clusters that are seen, they're just showing different snapshots as they come together. If we were to actually make a movie of a single cluster, we'd have to observe for four billion to 10 billion years. We're a bit constrained. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're very young. We're only five billion years old here. You know, it's nothing. The history of the universe. All right. So there are more questions online. So from Zaidan Abdul. Clustering and smashing happen only in regions of high density interstellar medium? No, that's a really good question. Um, yes and no, it depends on your definition of high. So, obviously, where you've got filaments of the cosmic web intersecting, there's a very high likelihood that you get uh, accretion and you get clusters merging. Um, but what we see as we get cosmological expansion is, of course, the. And so, I might see a pair of galaxy clusters. Uh, that are in the process of merging, but are otherwise isolated. They're not sitting in a supercluster or, or something like that. So um, it's really about the proximity of the two dark matter halos of the cluster uh, that determines that rather than the overall density surrounding them. Does that answer the question? I think so. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And another question okay, from the same person, Zen Abdul Wahab. So galaxy clustering due to the gravitational interactions of real matter, right? Yes, correct. So do that, do that matter play any role in the galaxy formation and smashing? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, so dark matter is also real matter. Um, it's just not visible. And so, yes, absolutely. It's extremely important to understand what the dark matter halo is. We have observations where from the uh, observable parts of the cluster, the merger axis doesn't make sense. But when you do dark matter mapping through gravitational lensing, so weak lensing, it, it does. And you can get um, a clear sense that that has been affected by the underlying dark matter distribution just as much as the visible parts. Cool. So any more questions from the floor? OK. Is always keep happening. Yep. So, uh, does it in any way affect our way to No, we, we are actually, funnily enough, not particularly near any galaxy clusters. We, we, we sit on the edge of the Virgo cluster, but we're not part of it. So, no. So, it's also a good question. Many years ago, I got asked that basically could, could a cluster merger have wiped out the dinosaurs? <laughs> So, any more questions? All right, cool. So, if there is no question, okay, we can end the session here. Okay, so thank you for the amazing answers in the Q and session just now. You can go back to your seat. Okay. Right. Well, hang on. Thank you all for, oh. for coming today uh, in the holiday period and listening to my, my talk. And thank you to Shifel and Zamri and Zamri uh, for making this a possibility. Um, my gratitude. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So as this. That's plus my heart felt good. And my name is Justin Holland, and all of you join me. All right, so today, so part of this incredible nuclear skies, 
if there is very foggy in KL today, and many selections in the full afternoon and until we meet again. But before we end our session, so let's... Yes, I mean, yeah. So we are going to take from here, and then you guys can get into this. Uh, fill in, <laughs> fill in this part of the seats. Yeah. 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 Yeah.